good concert. So. <laughs> Let's uh, pray. Father, thank you for this time. Just guide and direct us now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's uh, finish up on, on uh, views of hell. This is the eternal conscious punishment. Definition, those who do not accept Jesus as Lord and Savior are condemned to eternal conscious punishment in the lake of fire. Uh, we're not going to go over all these verses, but a couple of them, uh, to me, point out, seem to point out more than others the eternal nature of that punishment. Uh, Daniel chapter 12. Um, so e even though a lot of Old Testament passages seem to um, imply destruction and, and the fact that unbelievers do not have immortality, uh, this one, Daniel 12, 2, it says, at, at that time, Michael, uh, this is verse 1, uh, the great prince who protects your people will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes will sleep in the dust of the earth, will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. So again, the annihilationists would say, well, the everlasting contempt is, is talking about the place, not so much that person. But to me, it's kind of hard to, it's contrasting those who rise up to everlasting life and the contrast is to those who are, are resurrected to shame and contempt. Part of me says, if they're going to be destroyed, why are they resurrected? Why, why does that even happen? So that's one. Uh, the second one, second, or, uh, second Thessalonians 1. And um, we we'll skip down to verse um, verse seven. Uh, it's talking about God's judgment, uh, and God will give relief to those, um, to you who are troubled, and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction. Now that, when you think about everlasting destruction, you would think, well, if you're, destro if you're destroyed, then it's over. So the, this has the implication that this is something that keeps going on. So again, that, that's where we get the idea of, of eternal uh, punishment. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, uh, verse 42, that's in where Jesus is giving a number of parables about the kingdom. Um, and so he's talking about the parable of the weeds, uh, you know, where the, the weeds are planted and then they're pulled up and they're burned. And he says in verse 42, they will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will sun like, shine like the sun. So the idea is that when they're thrown into there, there's, there's this punishment that's going on rather than destruction that's going on. Um, Isaiah 33, 14. Thirty-three, fourteen says, The sinners in Zion are terrified, trembling, grips the godless. Who of us can dwell with the consuming fire? Now again, the idea where it says consuming fire, you think, well, that means they're destroyed. But notice it says, who can dwell with that? So it, it, it seems like those who are judged in this way, the godless, they're, they're going to be in the midst of this consuming fire. So to me, the, you could say the consuming fire is so hot that normally it would consume everything, but they're going to have to endure being in the midst of that consuming fire. That's how bad it is. You know, if you've ever you know, touched the stove and you didn't know it was on, how hot that is, well, 
you know, that, that's, that's hardly, hardly anything compared to what, how, how they describe the, the suffering in hell. Or the rest of this verse, who of us can dwell with everlasting burning? So again, it, the image to me is more of something that's going on forever rather than, rather than destruction. Yeah, it didn't consume it. And that's a good, good, good point. Yeah, uh, Matthew twenty-five forty-one. Then he will say to those on his left, "This is the judgment of the goat, the goats and the sheep." Uh, it says, "Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire." Prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. So on. Um, verse, skip down to verse 46. It says, then they will go away to eternal punishment. But the righteous to eternal life. So again, that seems to imply eternal punishment. That's the contrast to eternal life. Not death and, dis you know, not destruction or non-existence. It's actual, actually an eternal punishment. So, question was raised uh, by Nick. Um, the idea of, of how, how can eternal punishment be fair when you consider, even if you were to sin, every moment of your life, you, you know, your life on this earth, 80 years now, you could say maybe. Although, did you know that the lifespan of Americans has actually gone down the last few years. So um, I think one of the reasons is the rise of suicides, to tell you the truth. So anyway, um, so how, how, do you, how do you reconcile that? And, and you know, we, we have a real sense in, in our jurisprudence that the punishment needs to fit the crime, right? So that you, that's why we have certain crimes where you get certain amounts of time in jail. Uh, others, you get, in some states, you get the death penalty. In others, it's life in prison, so on and so forth. Um, but then even that, you're often evaluated. And if, you're, if you do well in prison and your sentence is such that it allow you for parole, then you can be released early. So if, if our government, which is supposedly secular, even if it has some principles that they are that are based on Christian truth if if our government can act that way and show mercy how 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 can we say that God is a God of mercy and loving compassion um, when when he he punishes those for eternity that that their crime was just for a time of 80. So who wants to answer that? Who's got the brilliant answer to that? Have you even thought of that ever? Does it bother you? Well, obviously it bothers Nick. He brought it up. So does it bother any of you? Yeah. See, I, I hadn't heard that, you know, growing up in church. It was only later that I realized that. It really bothered me. So anybody know, think of an answer? Or something you might say? Anybody? So we could just say God is not eternally merciful and righteous. <laughs> At least not to those people. Okay, let me ask you this. If I were to invite you over to my house for lunch, and you sat down at the table, put your elbows on the table, you hunched over your food and just, you know, shovel it into your mouth, chewing with your mouth open. In other words, all the, all the manners that your parents should have taught you on, on how to eat. And uh, I then said, okay, that's enough. This is disgusting. Here we invite you over to our house and this is how you, don't you have any manners? I don't think we'll ever invite you over to our house again. You would maybe feel a little shame. You might say, oh, I didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> I don't know how you'd feel. Okay, so here's a second scenario. You're invited to the White House, White House dinner. 
Are you going to do the same thing? And if you were to act like that, should your consequences be any different than the consequences I would give you at my house? Yeah, it could be. Why? Because the president is so much more important than I am. So that's one of the responses I've heard, is that you don't look at the crime itself or the duration of it as to how God judges. You look at who was offended in the sin, in the, in the, in the wrong that was done. So God being eternal, God being perfect, so a crime against him even if it's the same crime that would be perpetrated against me is so much worse and deserves so much greater punishment. So that's one response I've heard. It's about the only response I've heard. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and, and offending an eternal God. Yeah. So let's say I was Cain and like I killed a man, right? Mm-hmm. That, was like, that was my sin, and I you know, lived a horrible life, 80 years old or something, right? And I died. And so I I'm, like, I'm lived a billion years in hell, and it's still, like, I still got to live another, have another infinity yeah. after that, and it's still so bad. But like, the difference is that I don't understand Part of this is probably just my lack, lack of understanding of like the cross and everything, but if Jesus came down and he died for the sins of like millions or billions of people and it took him like three days to, to bear that weight, <laughs> then like how could that equate to one person's sin lasting for like billions plus years? That's, those are great, great, great questions. You can see why some people would tend, you know, believe in annihilationism, conditional judgment, and so on and so forth. I'm not uh, I that. No, I, I, well, even if you did, I'm not, I, that, to me, that's not necessarily a heresy, okay? So it, that wouldn't bother me. Um, but I guess the, the other way to look at it is sometimes I think I know for myself, you know, for instance, I remember reading something from somebody who was, who was criticizing Christianity and basically said, if a human father has forgiveness for his human son for some terrible sin, how, how come God can't do that? And, and I used to think, wow, man, that's heavy, you know. <laughs> But then the, another part of me said, wait a second, God's on a whole nother level. Why are we even comparing God with us? And that's when I realized on a lot of these things, for even, even the illustration you gave, you said, so I, I'm like Cain, I, I murdered my brother. Then, then the way you presented it, it was almost like, and from then on, I didn't have any major sins. Now, I, I didn't, say you, didn't say you didn't sin, but you acted like there was no other major sin the rest of your 80 years. But see, th- th- this is, again, a human perspective of it. If, if God is an eternal God and a holy God, why does he say, do not lie? See, you see, all you've got to do is go through the Ten Commandments and start to realize, okay, maybe I haven't physically murdered anyone, but like Jesus said, if you've hated someone, you've murdered them in your heart. You've committed adultery, even if you didn't do it physically, if you looked after somebody who was not your spouse. And same way with lying and cheating and all that kind of stuff. So those are all just in the Ten Commandments. And if you're honest with yourself, you have to say, wow, I've broken every single one of those. And then if you multiply that by how many days you've lived on this earth and how many times you've sinned, and you realize that you're offending an eternal holy God, that's that's how I finally began to realize it. Who am I to say to God? That, that would be like you've committed a crime, you're standing in the court, and you, they go through the procedures of the laws of the court, 
and you're pronounced guilty and you're, you're given a, 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 um, a punishment um, and you then say, well, that's too harsh, that's too mean. I, you know, I'm really, down, I'm really a good person down deep inside. One crime and I was caught. I know five guys that did the same crime, they were never caught. See, that's a, that's a human sinful response rather than to say, wow, that's a holy God that I'm offended. Who am I? That's why even Isaiah, when he was in the presence of God, he said, woe is me. What, what does woe is me say? I'm a dead man. And what was his crime? He said, I live in the midst of, of lying people. He didn't even say, I'm a liar. But he said, because I'm part of the Jewish nation, I'm just as sinful as they are. And they are really sinful. So he, ne he never, in a sense, admitted his own sin. But in a sense, by equating himself with the rest of Israel, he, he took it upon himself. And then when he realized in the presence of a holy God, he said, I'm a dead man. You, you have every right to just do whatever you want with me. Well, and I dwell in the, you're right. So he did admit to that. But, you know, as we categorize sin, we go, unclean lips. Well, so he said a bad word a few times. See, those are one of those sins we kind of go, well, God, God just kind of forgives that one. Yeah, exactly. And, and I believe more and more we're becoming more and more desensitized to it. So that when people talk about hell, when they talk about judgment, they look at you like you are such a freak now these days. So I don't know if that's a satisfying answer. In one sense, it isn't very. But, but it's the idea of, of who God is that, that you have, to me, that's what I take into consideration to help me deal with these kinds of questions. Now, does it satisfy other people? I don't know. You'll, you know, you'll have to ask yourself if it satisfies uh, your inquiry into that. But for me, that's, that's how I approach it. And, and I have, in a sense, no understanding of how holy God is because I am so sinful. And the moment I start thinking, hey, I'm not too bad and God is really, you know, I, I could take pride in my sanctification kind of. But, but see, right there, the Bible says that's, that's sinful to take pride in that. And so, so when, you, when you read the Bible, when you see and read about God's will in relationship to what he has done for you and who you are, it, it, to me, it, it's, it's, that's it. That's a holy God. He can do whatever he wants with me. And, and in a sense, I have no right to salvation. That's why it's a gift. But man, am I thankful that he gave me that gift. And I guess I'm, even though I struggle with some of these aspects about hell, you know, I'm not going to say to myself, okay, I'm going to become an annihilationist because that, that seems a little more comfortable. Because I, I think about my loved ones. I have a son who is far from God. And so... You know, in those times when you're all alone, it's dark at night and you can't sleep or something, you start thinking all these weird thoughts, I'd start thinking about him in hell. I, I can't imagine that. And that's probably where we're going to deal with that more than, uh, than not. Because we've accepted that gift of forgiveness. So we, we feel that, we experience that, we know that. But it's, it's our friend that we're talking to. It's our brother or sister. It's our parents well, whoever it is that's close to us. And if we really believe in eternal judgment, even if we just believe they're not going to exist forever, it, it, it's almost like you kind of want to go, wow, this is still a very hard doctrine to accept and to deal with. So, yes, go ahead.
Yeah, that's, a, that's another way to look at it. Yeah, I think that's good. My, my father-in-law, for the longest time, um, even though his, his wife, his three daughters, and all three daughters married Christian men, his grandkids were all in church, Christians. Um, he, he in, in fact, uh, Tricia would often, uh, since she only lived four hours from college, would bring some of her friends over the weekend down to her house. And on Sunday, they'd say, well, how come your dad's not going to church? Well, because he's not a Christian. What? <laughs> you know, they'd be so surprised because of the way, way he lived. But this is what he would say. He goes, when you die, you die. You're just in the ground. That's it. So to me, when you, if you move towards, towards annihilationism, that's kind of the thinking you get. And that's why, I, even though I see a lot of attractive stuff in that, I, I haven't made that switch to that yet. Because it, to me, it's, it will, if I, I, I fear if I really believe that and live my life that way, I would start thinking less and less of how you just described it, the eternal joys that God is giving to those who actually believe as a gift from him. And I, I really like the way you put that, that when you look at what God desires for us and what God desires for his people, even for those who are not believing in him, that's his ultimate desire for them, how great that is, so that if people actually reject that, then how terrible would be that punishment. Exactly. Maybe it gets stronger at some point, but it doesn't. But when we go to heaven, like there is no more tears, there is no more sorrow, oh. there's no remembrance of the things before. If you're married, you're not, you're not married anymore in that sense. You're still there together, but it's different. And so it seems today that we're not going to remember those who are lost in eternal yeah. torment. And so that's why the urgency is done now. Yeah. Now. No. Exactly. This now is the time. Otherwise, it's like, you know, it would be a very great place to go to heaven and be like, oh, man, all, yeah, all those yeah. people didn't make it. Yeah. Like, My grandma's in hell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, anyway, this is what Charles Spurgeon said. If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. If they will perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees. Let no one go there unwarned and unprayed for. See, and so for us, even if we may waver on what hell is actually like, we know that the Bible is very clear that there's going to come a judgment. Okay? And so if people are going to be judged, should we not have that heart to bring the gospel to them? I didn't see this episode of... of um, I forgot the, the name name of the TV show, but it was um, anyway. It was it was a gal and and um, her boyfriend uh, said he was a Christian, but he didn't necessarily act like one. And he even would say to her to his girlfriend, "Well, you're going to be in hell. You're going to go to hell." And finally, she just said, if you really believe that, you would not be saying it that way. You know, you'd be so concerned for me. And there is a lot of truth to that. And so that, that for me, is a real reprimand. Do I really have that kind of attitude and feeling towards people around me that I know have not accepted Christ? So... And then, of course, there's the other idea that, that C.S. Lewis said that in, in, in the end, there's going to be those people who say to God, thy will be done. But there will be people that God will say to them, thy will be done. That's why I cannot believe in a universalism, because I believe, what about that person who does not want to believe in God? Does that mean he's going to be forced to believe in God? So, isn't it like hope? Hope is something we have now. It's not something we're going to have later. So once you, you, once you are at that point where you've rejected God and 
God. Yeah. You're standing before him. You have no way that you can say he is not God. Yeah. I, I, but your chance was gone. Yeah. Again, we think, oh, those guys in hell, they're going to be saying, I want to get out. I want to get out. How do we know that? Maybe they're, they're down there just cursing God the whole time. Yeah, they're in punishment. I'm not denying that. But they're, it, it, it's like the addict who blames everybody except himself for his problems. So you got everyone in hell blaming God for their situation. See? All right, any questions on, on hell? Okay, we, we have a, a, a project from, is it Lily? Yeah, you want to you want to show it? Okay. And I don't think we're really going to have time for the uh, quiz. So I can give it to you if you or you can have it, but you won't have the answers. <laughs> yeah, or yeah, just come on up here. Can you come up here and? These are all your friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I don't know who's seen these or haven't. Oh, that you, most of yeah, them have seen them already? Okay. So basically, I painted these in February for the project. That you okay. Asked for, and they had to be biblically based. So I painted two. One was a biblically accurate angel. So it looks like this. Oh, wow. semester, um, <laughs> Nick and Seth mentioned how Satan could be a dragon, and so I painted Eve, Eve being tempted by the dragon with no. the Whoa. Oh, yeah. That so cool. That's a good one. So. I feel like they should be forever apart. <laughs> well, you should hang them up at least while you're here. Yeah, you, you should hang them up at least while you're here until you're until you leave. Because look how bare these walls are. Yeah. So. <laughs> Hanging on the side of my bed. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, is everyone going home after the semester? Anyone staying here? Or want? So. That many? Yeah. Wait, you're what? There's a bunch of us on one flight out of here. A one flight out of here? Yeah. You're going to be like the uh, Jewish rabbis when I went took a trip to Israel? Well, they all gather in the back of the plane and have a prayer time. And these, some of these were like Orthodox Jews. And one guy he just was yelling at the uh, yeah. flight attendant because they had him seated next to a, a woman. So. I know, so anyway, <laughs> that's right, just, you just at, the, at a prescribed time, all of, all of you get up and start singing or something. <laughs> so those of you who are staying here, do you have something already planned or are you just trusting God to <laughs> make, help you survive in Kauai, <laughs> both? <laughs> all right, good, good. Are some of you going to be connected with the school doing anything, or, or are you, uh, do you, you have to, you have, you have to stay back another, another year because you failed? It? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if, if they're going to ha have you do an evaluation sheet, but this is my evaluation sheet. So. What's that? <laughs> Inspector. <laughs> yes. I have a question not about hell, but just kind of about a question I've had for sure. a lot of time. Sure. Um, on the topic of suicide. Yes.
It, it doesn't. It, that, was, that was basically the teaching of the Catholic Church for the longest time, the Catholic Church, and I think in their doctrines they still have it. But I've also seen instances where, where Catholic priests have officiated over a suicide, stuff like that. So I want, I want you on... I, I want you on this evaluation to be honest, okay? So, <laughs> but yes, I I do not believe that uh, that the Bible says that you'll go to hell if you commit suicide. I do believe suicide is sin, but since I believe that that when you trust Christ, all your sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven. Be sure to answer number three. No, no be, be, sure be sure to answer number three. Personal appearance. Handsome, a real Adonis. Do you need a definition on Adonis? That was one of the Greek, Greek gods. Handsome. Uh, far out, out of sight. Far out. I know. It's, it's, this is a little dated. Far out, out of sight. Those are... <laughs> No, you don't. You don't need to do that. It's, it's all a joke. So, yeah. I, I don't want. I don't want to see these. No, yeah. It's, yeah, this isn't a serious thing. Why well, had you guys going? All right. Anybody else have any? Uh, any theological questions? Anything you want to ask? Any personal questions? Or you don't know where to go from here. I frustrated what? Your brain? On what? Hell? Yeah. Well, it is a difficult. We could discuss. I I had on my on the outline there. You know how how do we talk about hell in this secular age when most people don't even believe in hell should we even talk about it to unbelievers yeah it's a discussion question I'm throwing it out there is anyone even concerned is are you even concerned about that how do you how do you talk about hell in our secular society or should we be talking about hell in our secular society? Remember that a lot of the descriptions of hell in, in the Bible, like like you know, uh, consuming fire, darkness. Uh, they they may be metaphors. They may not be re literal. And so, to me, you that that may be the way to talk about hell, is to talk about, for instance, b absence from God, uh, being away from any kind of uh, relationship with the spiritual. Um, despite the fact that, that our society is more and more secular, um, G.K. Chesterton said that when people stop believing in God, it's not that they don't believe in anything, it's they'll believe anything. And for instance, I don't know if you keep up with the news, but um, there was... Now, I don't know if it's happened already or if it's going to happen, but there's a, yeah, I think it already happened. Satan Con, <laughs> it's a convention for Satanists. And, and they've had these before, but, but COVID kind of stopped it. Well, this was the biggest attended convention they have ever had. 
And there were a couple of Christian groups, uh, that one guy who leads worship, who led worship during COVID that got into a lot of trouble, Sean Fecht, I think is his name. He, he had a group of Christians were there. They had like a booth there. And uh, the report was the number of people that had given their life over to Jesus. So, but, so you have something like that going on. Um, I was reading some stuff about spring is the time where you, you have a lot of spring festivals that are very pagan in a sense. When I say pagan, I'm saying it belongs to this earth. It's earthly. There are things that people followed. There's a lot of spiritualism, mysticism in it, but not necessarily based on any religion. It's, it's all about worshiping the earth, glorifying the earth, um, you know, rocks, crystals, all that kind of stuff. All that stuff is all on the rise. So that in itself should tell us, speaking about heaven, which is a spiritual thing, heaven and hell, those are both spiritual things, should be something that people are interested in or might talk about. You just, we just have to be very careful. Don't talk about you know, eternal torment by God, you know, something like that. You talk about absence from God. You talk about you know, uh, uh, you know, people who are suffering and stuff like that, and you, you could then then make the, make the transition to you know, suffering for, for a long time. What, what do you think that means? And do you think people who are suffering here on this earth and they die in their suffering, what's going to happen to them? Do they ever get justice? You know, talk about things like that and, and as, a, as, a, as a, a way into talking about spiritual things, heaven and hell, judgment, sin, and things like that. Uh, so don't, don't feel that just because our world is more secular and that people seem to criticize, organize Christianity, that they're not interested in spiritual things. Uh, Dan Kimball, who, who uh, used to lead a huge youth ministry on California and then started a church that, that really appealed to a lot of younger people, um, and some people accuse him of being progressive rather than evangelical, but I haven't really seen that. But he, I read an article that he wrote about talking to hell in this, in this secular age, and uh, you know, he took a survey of like 800 uh, high school kids and uh, they said their favorite, one of their favorite subjects was to talk about hell. They wanted to talk about hell and realize that because of the movies and stuff like that, everyone has some concept of hell. Unless they don't watch the movies, none of that stuff. Uh, in Christianity, a lot of our views of hell are actually from Dante's Inferno <laughs> rather than from the Bible. <coughs> So that's where the more you know what the Bible says, and especially when you read when the Bible talks about hell, the context, that'll help you to make the transition from just a general conversation to maybe talking about spiritual things, even heaven and hell. So don't, don't be afraid to do that. And don't feel that just because you are wavering on how you view hell, that that's a reason for you not to talk about it. Again, we don't, we don't just talk to people because we feel we, we have an authority on that. We, we understand it all, and we're just spouting our wisdom. No. Look at conversations as, as an opportunity to explore things, not as a way to just necessarily tell somebody about something. So don't, you know, and, and there's probably many things in the Bible that you, you feel hesitant about, that if you, especially if you've heard differing views and you've got to go, well, I don't know which one I, I really believe in. Don't, don't ever feel that that's a reason not to talk about those things, but rather to actually look at it as a reason to talk about those things so that you can learn more and grow and, and maybe come to a conclusion or to say, you know, I, I don't know if there's one view to do this, but I'm glad I know the differing views on this. And it's the same way since our world is getting smaller and smaller and we have people that live right next door to us or down the street that are Muslim or Hindu or whatever, you need to find out where they're coming from. Did you know that Muslims believe in a second coming? They believe in the second coming. They call them the Mahdi. 
but there's a lot of things that's very similar to the second coming of Jesus Christ. But that would be natural because Muslim faith came out of Christianity and Judaism. So. All right, any other questions, comments? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I read the whole thing. Can we turn this into Rick? <laughs> what you need to do is put his name on there in his course and say, yeah, I found this, and yeah, that's what you ought to do. <laughs> I, I think he would appreciate it, or at least go, what is that? Where'd that come from? So. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure teaching, and uh, some of you I know your names, others of you I'm sorry, I never got your <laughs> names. <laughs> and guess what, I'm not going to try anymore. I was trying, but <laughs> yeah, hopefully the ones who stay on island, I'll at least uh, remember your names, and, or at least get to know your names or something, so. Um, so anyway, and uh, when you, those of you who came up to the North Shore really enjoyed that. People up there really enjoyed that. Got a real feel of the school and what, what's going on here. You guys were great representatives of the school. So you should tell Rick you ought to get paid for coming out to the North Shore. And <laughs> what, the one the, oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I did sit in the very last part what he said. Uh, don't, don't touch money, don't touch women, and don't touch... Uh, a glory. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, thank you, anyway. Well, thank you. All right. Hopefully, I'll see you one more time that Wednesday final dinner. I, I never pass up an opportunity for food. Thank you, Steve. All right. Yep. Yep. All right. <laughs>